Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for our live stream. We have, as always, our curator, Nicholas Nicholson, and I, the executive director of the Russian History Museum, will be joining you for this conversation today. And as always, we welcome your questions, your comments. We want this to be an interactive program. Um, and we are focusing today on a couple of books in our collection that depict various costumes and various ethnicities of peoples that inhabited the Russian Empire. So um, I wanted to jump right in and talk about um, what inspired this live stream. A couple of weeks ago, I asked my colleague to look for a specific book. It was a religious book. Um, and he didn't find what we were looking for. Uh, we were looking for some illustrations for a Facebook post. Um, but we did come across this, um, this book, The Costume of the Empire of Russia, published in the early 1800s in England. And um, of course, that brought to my attention uh, another book that we have, which also illustrates uh, the, the various costumes of the various ethnicities within the Russian Empire. So we thought, well, why not explore this? And a little caveat, neither Nick nor I, maybe Nick more than I, are professional um, historians of, of uh, ethnography. Um, so please take uh, what we say with a grain of salt. This is more of an exploration and we're just here to talk about these things, ask questions, find out more. So it's always great to do research on the things that we find in our collection. Um, so Nick, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and we'll be off to the races. Sure. Um, I'm Nick Nicholson, and I'm the curator uh, here at the Russian <laughs> Museum of Russian History in Jordanville. I'm actually in Jordanville this time, which is kind of great. And so it's I'm in the library surrounded by books and objects, and it's super exciting because I've been locked in an apartment in Brooklyn for the better part of a year. Um, Michael uh, brought to our weekly meeting this amazing misfiled book. And it's kind of like meeting a lost member of a very large and important family because the originating source for the material in this English book is a really important work of the 18th century in Russia and a book which um, was the first major Russian effort into the world of ethnography and uh, one of the first studies of the indigenous peoples of the Russian empire. Uh, this cover is spectacular and humorous in its own way. This frontispiece shows the great falconet sculpture of Peter the Great in St. Petersburg, but dwarfed by it at the bottom are two tiny indigenous people who appear to have fought their way to St. Petersburg to pay homage to Peter the Great. And that's actually how we're gonna start our lecture um, a little bit. Peter the Great, uh, as we all know, was an important uh, emperor in Russian history and founded the city of St. Petersburg. There was a lot of Northern and Western expansion of the empire during his reign, but he also made enormous strides to the East into Siberia. And he also was the founder of the Russian Academy of Arts and Sciences, which was built in St. Petersburg in the 1740s. And he invited very important Western scholars to come and live and work in his new capital of St. Petersburg. He provided them with uh, stipends and all of the access they needed to historical materials that were available in Russia. He went on a buying binge of um, documents and books to help assist these scholars. And one of the most important um, was a man named David Gottlieb Messerschmitt, um, who led a really important an expedition into the East and into Siberia. This great Northern exhibition um, with an academic troupe, which included a man called uh, Gerhard Friedrich Muller, who we're going to talk about uh, a little later. Oh, well, here he is. Here's Mr. Muller in a strange 19th or 20th century um, illustration of him. I couldn't find an original one. This is the best the internet has to offer for today. Um, but they went on this massive exposition, expedition into the interior of Russia, into Siberia, 
Siberia. They went as far as Kamchatka. They um, recorded very carefully in pencil and pen all of their observations of the people that they met during their travels. There were drawings made of indigenous costumes and residences. They tried to create uh, geographic surveys as well as these uh, views and these looks at the, uh, the peoples of the Russian Empire, which was, of course, enormous. So this um, Bering expedition was um, collected into a very large and important document uh, called the History of Siberia, which included most of the pertinent uh, scholarly and scientific information gathered during these journeys. And what um, came out of that enormous uh, survey, which built this book, The History of uh, Siberia, was um, a work by uh, the hero of our lecture today, one of the heroes of our lecture, uh, Mr. Georgi, whose picture comes up next. Um, Johann Gottlieb Georgi was um, a Russian-born uh, ethnographer, and he took and um, organized all of the information that had been gathered by this previous expedition. And he created a very important work, which became very influential in the reign of Catherine the Great. It was published um, in 17... Let's see, sorry, I'm forgetting the date. 1776, 1777, in the reign of Catherine II, Catherine the Great, called the description of all peoples living in the Russian state. And this was a large and very lavish book. We've got a copy of it here at the um, Russian History Museum up in Jordanville, three volumes. And it shows in these incredibly lavishly illustrated uh, books all of the various costumes of the Russian Empire. And it was, for most Russians and definitely for Europeans, the first introduction into the incredibly rich and diverse um, peoples of the Russian Empire. The empire, as you know, we now know, you know, we say it covers 18 time zones. Um, people weren't really aware of that in the period, but it's a vast and diverse uh, group of um, ethnic types and ethnic peoples. And there are descriptions of all of the different groups, some, as Michael noted earlier, not particularly flattering. Um, it is definitely, as we would say now, completely Eurocentric and uh, probably not the most objective series of observations. But these books were published with these beautiful engraved illustrations that were then colored by hand. So this was um, not color printing, but printed col printing with color. And these became very, very important very quickly. And uh, if I may jump in here, first of all, you notice that we have three volumes here. We have uh, the first three volumes. There is a fourth volume. Uh, these, the Russian translation, the Russian edition was published in 1799. There was an earlier publication of the original German. Um, so if anybody has the fourth volume that they'd like to donate to the, to the museum, we wouldn't say no. Also, I do want to point out that these um, books have been conserved. They've got, undergone conservation, deacidification of all of the, um, of the pages. The pages were mended and this clamshell box was created uh, specifically to house them. So they're in good shape right now. And um, fantastic quality of the paper. It's just interesting to compare uh, this, this 18th century paper with what we, um, with some of the books that were printed in the early 20th century that are just crumbling. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is as Nick noted that um, this was a serious scientific expedition. These were not, um, these works were not based on hearsay. Um, and I have an example of um, not, not too long before these books were published. Uh, for instance, there was a traveler, a Czech traveler by the name of Bernhard Leopold Franz Tanner um, in 1579, he published a book where he described his travels in Russia and as an example of the wild tales and the myths that circulated um, was that he said that in, in the east, somewhere in Siberia, there are sable hunters who hibernate throughout the long winters. And excuse the graphic image here, but um, their mucus uh, flows out of their noses, creating these huge icicles. And then once spring arrives, um, they get, uh, they, they're revived, they go back to their sable hunting. So these kinds of myths are flying around and that's the, the image that the foreigners have of the Russian empire. So I think in a way it was to counteract uh, these kinds of fables that were being propagated um, 
not too long before the, the publication of, of these uh, volumes. Another thing I wanted to note is I look at these portraits and these bewigged gentlemen, and I cannot imagine for the life of me how they would have traveled. Um, I think one of the expeditions that I read about uh, covered 18,000 miles. And I, for some reason, I have this cognitive, cognitive dissonance uh, seeing these gentlemen in their, in their fancy clothing and wigs and how did they um, travel and endure the hardships of travel. Somehow that doesn't mesh with me. So um, anyway, just, just it's, a little. Yeah, it's, um, it's actually, it's an enormous thought because that first book was organized into a series of essays about all of the different regions broken down into sort of large sections. So there were sections on European Russia, on Siberia, on the Caucasus and on Central Asia. Um, and I, like you, I can't believe they actually covered all of those square miles themselves without being killed or dying, particularly in the period. So I am sure there are vast tracts of Central Asia where they met a guy who met a guy and they got some information. Um, it's it's a it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, but it was it was the standard by which everything was judged from that moment on, and it became hugely important really quickly. Um, the first person who was really interested in Gyorgy's work, uh, sorry, Mueller's work was, was Catherine the Great. And um, we're gonna take a moment here and just look at some of these amazing uh, engravings of all of the different types. The, um, yeah, the so detail is really quite extraordinary and they're very well done. The cross hatching is really very simple, like a coloring book, but they managed to convey an enormous amount of detail in the use of line. And so we see with these carefully colored illustrations, um, there must have been a master book for the painters to use in order to replicate the colors. And we noted when we did a lot of research online that there are various editions and the colors vary from one book to the other, um, largely probably because of the hand of the artist, but also because of condition. But you can see here, um, I mean, these costumes could really, could be replicated largely from these. We've got this wonderful guy from Kamchatka in his winter clothes. Yeah, so we have a lot of images um, from the book. We're not gonna get into ev every single ethnicity and, and the descriptions, um, but we just wanted to give you a variety, a sense of the variety of the costumes, of the, the, the clothing, the types of clothing that they encountered during the expedition and the various uh, peoples that uh, were inhabiting the vast Russian empire. It's of course, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about because these weren't just scientific or ethnographic. They, um, they supported and they underscored uh, Peter's attempts at Westernization. Um, he was emphasizing the fact that the Western Russians were civilized and scientific and that the vast, you know, reaches of the empire were full of people who were pagans and not orthodox and not civilized. And um, it really sort of shows that the, the goal, of course, is for Russia to spread and for civilization to spread. Um, and that these are, these are exotic curiosities more than anything else. Um, I find it uh, interesting that the, the poses of these um, characters are interesting because they're sort of remind me of classical uh, sculptures of Roman or Greek sculpture. And uh, even though they're wearing these, uh, these, these indigenous costumes, um, they're very much European in, in, in the way that they're depicted, I think. Absolutely. I mean, these all of these poses would be equally at home in a series of engravings of courtiers at Versailles in the period of Louis XV. <laughs> you know, right. hand on hip, delicate attitudes to express, you know, uh, their their various uh, attributes. But um, again, this the display of costume is really quite extraordinary. And I presume that in many of these cases, uh, these images are the only things that we have left of those cultures, which are now, of course, gone. Yeah, that this is one is is an uh, is uh, depicting a summer dress. Um, it's interesting to me that you have fur and and leather uh, being used for summer. So I wonder how harsh the climate was uh, in the winter. If this is the the summer version of of the native dress, it, I will say it doesn't look like he's doing that baby any good. He looks pretty uncomfortable to me. 
I also found it interesting that um, so several of the costumes are depicted both front and back. So there is very much uh, an attention to detail. Sometimes you'll have um, instances where the, the characters, the, the people are uh, depicted from the side, from the back, from the front, which really gives you a lot of detail. Um, and, and certainly there is this scientific approach to, um, to, to making a record, an accurate record, um, of, of what they saw. So this is an example of that, uh, one of the costumes shown from the back. And a Yakut warrior. Uh, and here's the front. Nick, do you know anything about, uh, we've already encountered some of these um, rodents <laughs> hanging from, <laughs> have you come across any information about the, the significance of these? This is not the first time that we're encountering them. I, I have not, to tell you the truth. And it's kind of remarkable to me that no one has remarked that people are wearing full, um, full skins. Um, but as we know, um, the Russians excelled at, in the fur trade, and I'm sure that they came into contact with people who uh, were also looking for indigenous furs, uh, particularly in, in the regions that they visited. There's a lot of fur in these. Uh, it's an indication of the climate, of course. The, a lot of these are, this is, I, I simply can't even understand this one, to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> Is it a walking stick? Are these like snowshoes? Uh, yeah, I think they're like snowshoes slash skis of some kind. Um, and there, there's some kind of hunting going on here. Uh, ermine, right? Gronostai would be exactly. ermine. He's ermine hunting. And then we've got a, a tartar from Kazan. Um, of course, Kazan was very populated as time went on and became quite a, a Russian center. But um, these are early inhabitants of that region. Bashkir. So I want to remind our viewers, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, we do have a question which will be, uh, so Dushanka is asking, can you comment on the porcelain Russian costumes by Gardner that was also commissioned to depict the different ethnic uh, Russians. So we are going to get to that. So thank you, Dushanka, yeah, for I'm that gonna, question. We're going uh, we'll to thank you, that very soon. Exactly. So uh, lots of various illustrations. We're going to, um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the, the printing process um, because this was not a cheap, uh, this was not an inexpensive procedure. Um, there's two types of process, uh, printing processes going on here. So for the book, for the book itself, for the text, um, they're using what's called relief printing. In this case, it would be letterpress. So um, in relief printing, whatever is not, um, the, the, the ink goes on the raised surface. So you can see here the red, um, that's where the ink would go. Um, the uh, engravings are printed using the intaglio uh, method. So intaglio printing is when the area is lower than the printing area. So what happens is by various means, you make grooves in the matrix or the plate, and then you fill it in with ink, um, wiping away the rest of the ink, and you press under great pressure, you put um, the plate with the, the, the sheet of paper, and um, and that leaves the, the actual drawing. So here we have an example. Uh, you can see this copper plate uh, and the, um, I should mention that the illustrations were used, were made using copper plate um, engraving. And so here you can see that there's ink within the little crevices that have been created by a special tool. And this has gone through a, um, a press. Um, so this is the inked plate, then it is wiped off uh, the excess uh, ink is wiped off, and then it goes through this kind of um, uh, press, uh, pressing down on the paper, and that the ink in the indentations leaves um, the, the actual image. So here's a close-up of one of the images, and you can actually see what's called a plate mark. So because of the great pressure of the plate, you um, see an indentation in the paper uh, where the plate was. So this is the, where the matrix was. You can see the um, the, uh, the remnant uh, or the indentation that was created by the pressure of the, the matrix onto the paper. Um, so actually you would have to print them separately and then 
the illustrations were hand colored. So this was a tedious process and there's lots of uh, illustrations. Um, so they would have to be pr printed separately and then bound together into the volumes. Um, speaking of the coloring process, all of this was done by hand. So this is a, a recent acquisition, a recent gift from a generous donors of, a donor of ours um, who gifted us two prints uh, from, from the Georgi book. Um, and you can compare this print, which we received recently to the one in, uh, pardon me, uh, this is the one. So this is the one in the book. And this is the one uh, that uh, was a, a loose leaf print. So you can see that the, even though, though the coloration is similar, it's not identical. And same thing here. So this is from the book and this one is from uh, the, the loose leaf, um, which probably was part of a bound volume, uh, but was separated uh, at some point. So you can see that there's uh, some of the details are different. You can see the the red color over here on the headdress, you have this beading that's colored differently. So, but you know, overall the color scheme is more or less the same, but each uh, illustration will be different because the, the process was different. The, each one was colored by hand. Um, and I also wanted to show off the, the end papers that were printed. So um, during the conservation process, the end papers, because they were loose, were not reused, but they are saved there with the books, um, just to give an example of, just to show how it was bound before. So here we're turning to, uh, um, to Catherine the Great and... Uh, right, we're, we're coming up on, on Dushanka's uh, great question. Um, the books were incredibly popular. And by the time they came out, uh, Catherine the Great was incredibly interested in them. She was fascinated by the people of the Russian Empire, not a surprise. She was trying to underscore the fact that she was a Western European Russian when in fact she had been born a German princess. Um, so she had a real affinity towards these characters, these images. And she turned a copy of the Georgi book over to the Russian Imperial Porcelain Factory, which was reaching really the height of its 18th century achievement in the reign of Catherine the Great. And so she turned a copy of the book over uh, to a man who was called uh, Jean-Dominique Rochette, who was the chief modeler and um, the man responsible for creating all of the forms at the Russian Imperial Porcelain Factory. In this period, he studied uh, all of the drawings and then created from them a series of really beautiful and very important uh, 18th century figurines. Um, figurines of this type of peasant types, rural types had reached real popularity in places like Paris and Berlin where they were made um, by the Sevres porcelain factory and by the Kaiserliches Porcelain Manufaktur in Berlin. Also in Dresden, there was Saxon porcelain of this type. And Catherine and Rachette together worked on creating a series of figurines of these Russian types of the empire. And they were very important because they were so different from the ones that were being produced in Western Europe. They were uniquely Russian, a unique view. And Catherine uh, realized that they were an expression of her power and she would use them. For example, if there were uh, state dinners at which there were important foreigners or guests, these would be placed uh, in and amongst the table decorations. There were large platters, soup tureens, beautiful uh, porcelain for dining. And then these ethnographic figures would be placed on on the tables throughout them for people to look at. Not only because in that period, porcelain was almost as expensive as gold because it was so rare, but also it showed uh, people exactly how many peoples over which Catherine reigned as sovereign. It just emphasized and underscored her importance and her power. These figures were very, very popular, and um, they were sometimes given by the sovereigns as gifts. This comes out of a Christie's catalog, which is why the numbers are underneath it. But if you uh, care to go back through this lecture, you'll see that several of these figures are in the Georgi illustrations that we just looked at. Um, the figures became quite famous, though pe very few people had access to seeing them. And as a result, in the 19th century, they began to be copied by independent porcelain manufacturers. It's important to note also so that the um, the figurines um, in the this whole study of Catherine the Great and the figurines that were ordered by her from the Imperial Porcelain Factory were gradually expanded over time as more. Uh, 
more research was done. So it was not a finite number of types. They continued to expand. And even in the 20th century, uh, Nicholas II ordered some very extraordinary um, figurines of Russian ethnic types between 1908 and 1911. So uh, this was something that was very close to the heart of the imperial family and something that they did quite, uh, they stayed with, you know, for hundreds of years. They really felt that this was evocative and important. So here we come to the really interesting um, part of this lecture. This is the book which uh, Michael and um, I guess it was Andre uh, discovered misplaced in the stacks. This is one of those great English title pages. It's 1803, which was the year of the final expedition in Russia and of one of the editions of the Georgi books. But this book to her royal, dedicated to Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, the most competent judge, as well as the most liberal patroness of the fine arts. This work is humbly inscribed by Her Royal Highness's most obedient, most devoted and most humble servant, Edward Harding. Uh, Mr. Harding may have indeed been Princess Elizabeth's most humble servant, but he was also a plagiarist. Um, he had gotten himself a copy of Gyorgi's book and freely copied uh, all of the illustrations and much of the text and did an English edition. And in fact, while Michael and I were looking this up, we found um, there was even another edition done at the same time. These books were dedicated to Princess Elizabeth, who was one of the younger daughters of King George III. She uh, was known to be wildly curious. She uh, had a real interest in the arts and the sciences, in literature and in agriculture in particular. She had sort of a scientific mind and she was known um, in her family as sort of an intellectual. She didn't marry for quite a long time. And when she did, she uh, fell in love with Prince Frederick of Hesse Homburg. And they had a very successful uh, relationship and she continued um, with her sort of scientific endeavors in Germany once she moved there. But um, I am unclear on whether she even knew that she had been made the most uh, royal dedicator, dedicatee of this book. But uh, the book was published in London London, and it had the same kind of effect in London that it had had in Russia. People were wildly interested in this book and there are copies of it um, all over. Uh, you could find them in the Royal Libraries. In most of the libraries in England, there's a copy. So this was a book that had real serious effect. We um, can see in this next illustration, I had mentioned slightly earlier the um, the figures that had been uh, copied by other by other bookmakers. And if you move forward, you'll see that the gentleman in this was made into a figurine by the Gardner Manufactory, which was a, a 19th century porcelain manufacturer, a private factory in Moscow. So these were made even into the late 19th century as well. Um, here is one which is in our collection. And uh, you may have noticed the, the coloration is slightly different from the original book illustration to the 19th century book illustration to the Gardner figurines in this image and to the Gardner figurine in our image. There are slight variations everywhere. Um, but the thing that you will see is the, the Gardner figurines of the 19th century tend to be a little more uh, comical and um, a little more, um, shall we say caricatured than the 18th century figurines of the Imperial Porcelain Factory. Um, I have to say these Gardner figurines, uh, for those of you who are Fabergé freaks, these really have um, had an influence on the hard stone figurines done by the Fabergé workshops as well. So we have a tradition started by Catherine the Great in the Imperial Porcelain Factory that wanders through private porcelain factories and back into uh, the jewelry business. It's a, it's a fascinating progression. Now this one is says Kalmyk here at the bottom um, and it lacks the hard sign at the end, which means that this is from already the, the Soviet period. Um, and indeed there is a mark on the bottom that indicates that it's from the early Soviet period from the 1920s, uh, but they would have used the same molds. Is that right, Nick? Would Correct. They have used the same things, the same molds that were there from before the revolution and just you know, Absolutely. And once modern. again, we have we have another really interesting and important interpretation because the Soviets, of course, stopped producing luxury uh, porcelains for private use and began producing uh, propaganda porcelains and um, also um, 
porcelains that underscore the importance of labor. And so these ethnic uh, figures were considered, these are all people who are part of the new, the new Soviet socialist republics. These are all other residents of this, this great new prosperous nation. So it's interesting to me that in the Soviet period, they continued to produce these from the same molds. And here's another illustration. This is from a book published, I believe in, uh, what was it 18, I think 1870s, um, again, depicting the various costumes. And this inspired another figurine also from the, um, from the same time period as, as the previous one that I showed also from the early Soviet period. Um, but you can see that definitely it's quoting from the same uh, source. Absolutely. He's sort of a, a wild figure. The hat is terrific. <laughs> So a book like this, um, you can see in the illustrations, this is an original illustration from the Gyorgi uh, volume. And then here is the English copy, which you can see bears, um, it's very similar and it's certainly, uh, it's certainly of the same type, but we have uh, distinct differences in the quality of engraving. And we start to see that this looks even more like uh, fashion illustrations of the early Regency period and the late 18th century. There's this change of subtext. Um, this is really the beginning of sort of an exotic romanticism and uh, looking at foreign cultures as um, things to, to co-opt. It's kind of, it's, it's interesting. This woman has a rather unfortunate face. Um. Well, I wanted to read from the description. Um, you know, this is not a, uh, meant to offend anybody. It's just the way that they're, that this is how they're describing a woman of Lapland. The Lapland women are short, but often well-formed, obliging, modest, and extremely irritable. That's the first sentence of this flattering description. Um, another one was, they're not very kind to the people of Estonia. Uh, which we saw earlier, I believe. Um, they say that uh, the state of oppression in which they live, their poverty, their education, and their general habits of life have inured them to the severity of the climate, to indigence and humiliation. They are of a, a lazy disposition, dirty and drunkards. The women undergo fewer hardships than the men and are not deficient in beauty or vanity. So, you know, I'm sure that uh, the descriptions could be improved. Um, you can see that the, the publisher does actually quote in the introduction to the book that it, that, uh, it is based, the work is based on uh, the work of previous authors. So he does give some credit to the, um, the other persons who made the, the actual trip and traveled 18,000 miles to previous, get these drawings. Previous authors. Yeah. Right, the previous authors. Uh, but it essentially follows the same, uh, the same sequence as the Georgi book. So you start off with the illustrations. They're pretty much, they match, uh, they match the Georgi uh, illustrations uh, almost identically. So you can see that many of these illustrations are looking familiar, that we've already seen these costumes in the Georgi book. Here is the Kazan uh, Tatar woman whom we saw previously. Uh, here is the, the Tatar gentleman uh, whom we again saw in, in, other, on, in other illustrations. Um, again, the, the mounted gentleman shamans oh yes i think we remember this the uh the poor right those helpers. rodents are, are getting sketchier and sketchier with every <laughs> um they don't i don't remember if there's that they have costumes from the back and, and from the front so they've added some elements over here these kind of um dwellings i don't remember if they were in the georgi book um so there are some changes, but for the most part, they are copying the Georgi illustrations pretty closely. There are 70 plates in, the, uh, in this edition. So quite, um, quite the profusion of illustrations. 
Um, so I also wanted to mention that the uh, later authors and later uh, publishers would use these illustrations as um, the basis for illustrations in their publications. So you'll notice this is from the, the uh, English edition of the book. This is uh, from the Georgi edition, and this is also from the English edition, and all three prototypes um, are included in this illustration from a description of the travels of travels of one of the, the, the explorers up to the Arctic Ocean and um, published in 1833. So these become uh, quite popular. I think that, uh, you know, why, why reinvent the wheel? You already have these illustrations, so just recycle them. Why not? This actually, um, we I wanted to throw in. It's a wonderful painting um, by a man called François Joseph Kinson, and it's a painting of Sofia Pietrovna Svetchina. And Svetchina was the daughter of um, the state secretary of Catherine the Great. And by the time this painting was done in the late 1820s or 1830s, the books had uh, reached an incredibly wide audience. And one of the things that was published in them were images of Western Russian folk dress, including images of the sarafan, which is uh, a sort of traditional dress for, for women in Russia, which involves an underdress and an overdress and embroidery. And here you can see in this painting that Svetchina has adopted uh, this form of folk dress, but in a very lavish um, and beautiful style. You can see that she's got uh, very heavy gold embroidery and also um, there's a banded empire waistline. This uh, is part of the early romantic trend towards exotic costume. There was a lot of dressing in London uh, like the Turks. And this book, when it came out in London in 1803, may have had a much broader influence than we expect. And I have to thank the, the wonderful um, Caroline Guito of the Royal Collection in London, because in her recent exhibition on Russia and the Romanovs and uh, the British Royal Family, she pulled out this extraordinary costume, which is a Russian sarafan, which is in the collection of the British Royal Family, which belonged to Princess Charlotte, who was the niece of George III. And you can see that it bears real resemblance to the folk costumes that were first published by Georgi and then later, uh, but you can see in this painting by Svetlana. And then you can see finally in this extraordinary portrait by George Daw, she's actually wearing the dress along with her state order, the Order of the Garter. So these books, which were designed originally as a scientific exercise, ultimately came to be a, sort of a calling card for Russia in a way that Russian style and Russian culture were disseminated in Western Europe. This um, it's not unusual that this happened in this period and that this book was published in 1811. Uh, the Russian, Russia was part, everybody was in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars and um, Russia was an ally. And so there was an enormous amount of interest uh, in Russia in this period. And it's interesting to see a member of the British Royal family adopting um, the folk costume of, the, of another country. Uh, it's just, it's a fascinating look. And of course we love George Daw. And uh, in the Hermitage, there is, you know, the Hall of 1812 is full of all of these George Daw portraits of the Russian generals. So it's a period where there were real handshakes across Europe between Russia and the United Kingdom. And um, a lot of it has to do with this book and its dissemination. Now, uh, Nick, just to clarify, this was not made in Russia. This was, was this a Russian piece or this was a la Russe? No, uh, it is a la Russe. And any Russian will look at this and notice that it doesn't actually follow correct sarafan format. There is, there's no underskirt. It appears to be sort of just a long column shaped dress with like the uh, empire waist, right? in, in the, the correct place. places to look like a uh, Russian costume, but it is clearly inspired by um, the Russian works. And we know, uh, thanks to Caroline de Quito and her research, that Princess Charlotte referred to this as her Russian dress. So uh, that pretty much completes the, uh, the material that we have here. We have had uh, fewer questions and comments than usual. Um, if you want to uh, ask any questions, please go ahead. Oh, we, so we have a question from Maria. Was the main illustrator one person? If so, do we know how he managed to familiarize himself with the dress of each region presented to the degree portrayed? 
when travel at the time would have been long and arduous, and photography was still waiting to be discovered. I imagine one single person living in Russia at the time would not have been able to view all the national costumes in their lifetime. Correct. I agree with you 100%, Maria. And it's important to remember that the original illustrations and the sketches of the various peoples came from a group of people who were part of this original expedition. So there were multiple people involved in the original sketches and multiple people involved in the original trips to the multiple parts of the Russian Empire. So the original sketches were done by a multitude of different hands, but the final sketches for inclusion in the book were clearly done by one artist and then engraved by another. And I do want to say that they have been reused and I actually looked at some earlier versions of uh, this is I think a, na a native of, of Kamchatka and it's uh, the similarities are striking in terms of some earlier engravings. I also came across um, a drawing by a Frenchman who traveled to Russia and was part of an expedition led by another Frenchman. And it seemed like there may have been some uh, quoting from other sources. So some of the illustrations were based on actual uh, eyewitness. Um, you know, they, they were present, they were sketching um, what they had seen. But I think uh, sometimes when they were commissioned to do illustrations, they may not have had the opportunity to, to view all of this. So they would have referred to earlier, um, to earlier works by other artists. So I think it's a combination, but I think Georgi, um, if, I, if I remember correctly, he himself was an accomplished um, draftsman and he would sit there and, and draw, um, make sketches of this. And it's also very interesting um, to, to note how accomplished these individuals were. In addition to being a photographer, he was also, I think, a botanist and interested in chemistry. Uh, one of the works um, that he wrote, and I don't know if I understand this correctly, but it said, um, it was a, a, a treatise on the uses of a kartofilnaya mula, which would translate to potato soap. I don't know if that's, if I'm misunderstanding, if it's actual potato soap, but his, um, uh, his interests uh, vary greatly. And he also, also wrote a description of uh, the, the city of St. Petersburg and made drawings of that and maps of that. So it's incredible. Um, to, to think just how much these people accomplished in their relatively short uh, lifetimes, because of course the, um, they, they didn't live as long as, as we do nowadays. Um, and it's just incredible to think how much uh, they were able to do and how much, uh, how much ground they were able to cover both uh, physically and metaphorically speaking. Mm -hmm. It's also important to remember that Georgi, when he did his book, um, though he had been on some of the expeditions, he was actually synthesizing an enormous amount of work from earlier explorations and putting them all in one place. So um, again, we're seeing uh, one hand in the illustrations based on a much larger body of work by a much larger group of people. So going back to these um, porcelain figures, you can see over here, we can identify some of the characters that we've seen um, already. So this gentleman over here, I think, was uh, made an appearance. Uh, where was he? Was it this one? Uh, yeah, similar over here, similar costume. And then this is the, I think, the, the Crimean Tatar, if I remember correctly. So th uh, this one, right? Uh, mm -hmm. This yes, so this individual, this this figure, is um, here in the in the illustration. So um, we don't have any more questions or comments. So I think we will be logging off. Um, I do also want to remind everyone that we are in the um, end of our conservation and collections care appeal, our spring appeal. So if you'd like to make a donation, uh, we will put that link in the chat box. And um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you for everyone, to everyone who has, oh, we have some questions coming in. Um, so Dushanka again, was the expedition primarily for the costumes or did they also look to see how far Siberia went? Um, it's important to divide the intents of the publications 
uh, the first group of work done by Mueller and the scientific teams was really to discover the resources of the entire Russian empire, including its indigenous peoples. The book by Georgi focused exclusively on the costume of those peoples. He uh, also did books on Turkish costume and on Asian costume as well. So there was a lot of, um, that, that was his focus clearly. But there is, um, in addition, it's not simply a description of the costumes. I think that they serve as illustrations, but there's a lot of material on the customs of the people, uh, you know, how they live, the, the relationships, um, that they're, the social hierarchy that they have. So it, it really is an ethnogra ethnographic work. It's larger than, it's, it's not just, um, you know, about the, the clothing. Um, also, part of it was, I think that the French... Um, the French artist that I mentioned earlier accompanied a scientist who was tracking something to do with astronomy. They were tracking the, the path of comets or something like that. Um, and of course there was botany involved in, in natural history. I know, I think that there are minerals that are named or, or, uh, uh, named after or, or botanical species that are named after um, the people who are involved in these expeditions. So it was um, a, a holistic approach to, to exploration. It wasn't just costumes. It was figuring out what is out there. This, this was the wild east for the, for the Russians, so to speak. Um, we have a question from Nikolai saying, have any original costumes brought back, have any original costumes been brought back by the exped uh, ex expeditions to be out in museums, for instance, in St. Petersburg? I actually don't have a clear answer on that. Um, I do know that the Museum of Ethnography in St. Petersburg uh, was an incredible repository of many of the things that were collected during these. I'm unaware personally of uh, any costumes like these that were collected in the 18th century being part of that collection. But what I don't know could fill volumes. So um, you may want to do a little research and see what the Museum of Ethnography uh, has in their collection and when it arrived. Um, I distinctly remember something, and this is not an uh, ethnic costume, but certainly uh, something that um, quoted from it or, or used uh, the, the local um, resources. Uh, there was an, uh, an excellent exhibition on Russian America um, in San Francisco. It was a traveling exhibition, and one of the the pieces that really struck me was a set of vestments, of priest vestments that were made out of I think it was elk uh, skin and fur, or uh, maybe there was seal or something like that. Some kind of fur vestment, which of course usually would be made out of brocade or, or some other kind of textile. Um, but this was from, from the northern reaches of the, of the Russian Empire. Um, so I think if something like that survived, I'm sure that there, there must have been some kind of specimens that survived as well. I do know that um, I did read that Georgi, for instance, and uh, some of the other uh, explorers, they, they collected vast uh, collections of natural, uh, of, of uh, examples of um, botany and, and minerals, etc., what they had found during their travels. And Catherine the Great purchased uh, some of these collections and rewarded them handsomely. And, and in one case, she purchased the collection, but allowed um, them to keep it, keep them until the end of their life for further study. And so, um, of course, it, you know, this, this was sponsored, these expeditions were sponsored and appreciated by uh, Catherine and, and Peter and the other, uh, other Russian rulers. Um, and we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Do either of you have a favorite costume from the book? Nick? I, you know, it's, it's kind of a toss up right now. Um, I'm really enamored of the Bashkir with the phenomenally tall hat that was turned into the, um, the gardener figurine. I think uh, the, yeah, I think he's the other one with the, with the, the very red hat is really my favorite, but here, here we go. Yeah. That guy, I would wear that tomorrow. I think it's great. <laughs> um, but I must say that I, as of uh, working on this and getting these illustrations uh, for the, the exhibition, I am really fond of the shaman who appears to be dangling um, minks or ermines or something. I'm, or, or rodents of some kind, I'm not really sure, but the, the network of his costume is pretty extraordinary. You, Michael? 
You know, there's just so many to choose from. Uh, I think I love the the colors, the bright colors. It's extraordinary to see the the level of detail that went into these. It's extraordinary to see how vivid the colors are, despite the fact that literally centuries have gone gone by. Um, we're very grateful that the book is in such wonderful condition where we can appreciate all of the effort and the work that went into creating these illustrations. So really, I don't have um, I don't have a particular uh, a favorite costume. I think all of them have something interesting to offer. And for me, it's always as I leave through the book, it's just incredible to see how um, varied the costumes were and and how that reflects the uh, the various um, indigenous peoples of uh, that that were um, living in the the Russian Empire. So you kind of tend to forget that. I think that um, people tend to think of Russians as, as very homogenous, but um, you know these these were all living in in the empire that was ruled over by by Catherine the Great. So it's just really um, um, revealing to 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 flip through these illustrations and to see the variety, the beauty. Um, and the, the, also the careful attention that people put into creating these costumes. Some of them are everyday clothes and you would never think that from, from the, uh, the, the patterning, the decorations that are uh, there. So um, I think that's it for our questions today. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, thank you to everyone who has been supporting us through uh, moral, providing moral support, tuning in, uh, financial support for conservation of, of objects. Um, thank you. And we'll see you next month for our second Saturday lectures and for another live stream. Take care.